hello students uh, myself sanjeev from institute of physics bhubaneswar and i have given the responsibility to tell you about light sterile neutrinos so i would suggest that you know uh, i will go very slowly and try to tell you the story of light sterile neutrinos how they came into the picture and why they are so interesting that so many people in neutrino physics they are working on this topic so you can feel free to ask any time any question you can stop me or write your question on the chat box and some coordinator may help us to get your questions to me so please uh, feel free to ask questions we should discuss rather than you know i will be just talking in front of you let us try to learn something from next one and half hours of this lecture on sterile neutrinos so uh, as i told you that my topic is light sterile neutrinos so now these three e e words light sterile and neutrino all these three words are very important so before i talk about sterile neutrinos sterile as the name suggest that these neutrinos will not have any interactions with the known w or z bosons so they are not going to take part in the standard weak interactions but they have the flexibility that they can mix with our light active neutrinos and in this school you had lectures on various issues related to neutrino physics including neutrino oscillation neutrino mass neutrino mixing so we know what is we uh, this neutrino mixing is all about so these sterile neutrinos they can mix with the active neutrinos and they can also couple with the active neutrinos through yukawa coupling but remember the word sterile suggest that they will not have the standard weak interaction in which the three non light active neutrinos participate and i will explain why okay so before i discuss about sterile neutrinos let me briefly summarize okay our understanding about three light active neutrinos and their mixing and masses okay so i am on my first slide you should tell me if my slides are not getting changed so here in this uh, on this slide you can see on the left this is a nice you know picture of the basic standard model of particle physics which i am sure you all are familiar with and here you have these three nice repetitions of three generations you have the first generation particle then second generation particle and then you have third generation particle if you talk about a uh, talk in terms of flavors then you can see here that we have three light active neutrinos there sitting at the bottom you have electron type neutrino you have muon type neutrino and you have this third type tau type neutrino this third new tau type neutrinos are you know hypothesized or you know they came into the picture around 1970s but uh, we just discovered them in 2000 in fermi lab in donut experiment okay so we have these three light active neutrinos in the picture and we know that they don't carry any electric charge so they are neutral particles and also you can just you know write down the beta decay process and if you see the azimuth uh, angular distribution of outgoing electrons you can immediately figure out that the invisible neutrino should have spin half so they are fermions and the most important property uh, uh, that i would like to emphasize about these neutrinos that they don't talk to light so they don't have electromagnetic interaction they also don't interact with gluons so they will they don't have strong interaction but they only couple to weak force that means they can interact with w and z bosons 
so they take part only in weak interaction now you should understand the importance of the word weak since neutrinos only take part in weak interaction and let me tell you if you know if a neutrino is interacting with an electron around 1 gv the area available for that cross section is almost 14 orders of magnitude lower compared to the cross section you have at lhc when two protons collide so you can understand that at the very beginning the mammoth task that we had in our hand is to first detect these particles okay and we have been able to detect them because of the triumph in neutrino science especially the experimental techniques and i'm sure you guys have learned about so many fantastic experiments with several hands on session during this school and another important property that we need to understand in coming days that you know from oscillation we know that neutrinos are massive they are not massless but we need to accommodate this non zero mass in the basic standard model picture now over the last 20 years or so we have plethora of data from solar neutrinos atmospheric neutrinos neutrinos from reactor accelerators and if you study all these neutrinos they are pointing towards one common thing that if you allow these neutrinos to travel they change their flavor from one type to another and this is called neutrino oscillation and to have neutrino oscillation we need non degenerate neutrino masses and they should mix with each other but if you see the basic standard model picture then you know that to write down the mass term for any particle consider any particle you need both the left handed guys and the right handed guys but i am sure that you are familiar that so far in nature we have only observed left handed neutrinos and right handed anti neutrinos so we don't have right handed neutrinos or left handed anti neutrinos to write down the mass term in the basic standard model picture okay so now we know that neutrinos are massive because they oscillate but their mass is at least a million times lighter than electron so this is also very important to ask who ordered that why neutrino masses are so light compared to electron mass and we don't have any answer to that so we need to answer these questions in coming days now as far as neutrino detections are concerned the most important message that you should take home that in our experiments like charged particles okay we don't see neutrinos directly because they don't have any charge so what is the way we see these neutrinos when a neutrino comes and interact with your detector so this detector can be anything like water or like argon or scintillators anything okay or iron so in these detectors you have electron proton and neutron and when these neutrinos will come they will interact with these ambient particles inside the detector and through various processes they will create in the final state they are charged cousin so if you will have a electron neutrino you will see electron in the final state if you will have a muon neutrino then via charge current process you will see a muon in the final state and if you will have a tau neutrino you will see tau in the final state and when these electron muon or tau are produced inside your detector you should be able to see them because they carry charge okay so this is a very important difference when you deal with neutrinos <coughs> there are two things that you should keep in mind number one they only take part in weak interaction and number two they are neutral and these two factors 
makes our life very complicated. Okay, when we talk about detection of neutrinos. So I told you in the beginning that we have three light active neutrinos, and these sterile neutrinos should not take part in the standard weak interaction process. Now you can ask me why is there any constraint that these sterile neutrinos should not take part in a weak interaction? The answer is yes. So we had a fantastic electron positron collider experiment called LEP, Light Electron Positron Collider Experiment at CERN. And in that experiment, people measured the decay width of this neutral Z boson very precisely, okay? And when an electron and positron will collide, you see at the, in, uh, when these two particles are colliding, then the net charge is zero because electron is colliding with positron. So then if you have enough center of mass energy, they can create Z bosons, the neutral Z bosons, and that, is, that can all again further decay to pair of electron positron or muon anti muon or tau anti tau or pair of neutrinos. Now, when a Z will decay to charge particle pairs, you can see that in your detector, right? You can always see charged particles. And you can call it the visible decay width of Z. Now, the total decay width of Z is fixed, right? It depends on the lifetime, inverse of lifetime. Now, you have measured the visible decay width by seeing the charge particle pairs. Now, if you subtract that quantity from the total decay width, you will get the invisible decay width. Why it is invisible? Because there are particles like neutrino pairs. They are also emitted. And they don't leave any track, any sign in your detector. So we call it invisible decay. They are invisible particles. So we measured that invisible decay width. And from that, you can infer that how many light active neutrinos were there. So you can see, if you see my cursor, that the bound that we have on the light, three active neutrinos is three. And this is a very precisely measured quantity. You can see on the left-hand side, what has been plotted is the, you know, the cross-section available with a, as a function of center of mass energy. And you see, you see a peak along the mass of the Z boson. And there, you see that the data is getting fitted. The data is basically this, you know, these red dots. And you can fit the data quite precisely with a three neutrino hypothesis. And here, just to tell you that these error bars had been increased by factor of two, a factor of 10, otherwise you will not see them. So it is telling you that how precise that, that measurement was. So we learned the first lesson that because of the bound from the LEP experiment, we are not allowed to you know, you know, um, have extra species which can interact with W or Z boson. And that's why we call these neutrinos sterile. Okay. Now, I told you, and you have learned, there are fantastic lectures by Professor Boris Kaiser. We have all, you know, we have grown up basically learning from him, the neutrino, various aspects of neutrino physics. So you have learned already in this school that over the last 20 years, we had fantastic experiments. We have been able to detect neutrinos from sun, neutrinos from atmosphere, reactor antineutrinos, and then also accelerator neutrinos. And if you see these neutrinos, they are basically coming in the first generation with electron flavor or muon flavor or their antiparticles. 
Now you should appreciate when you talk about all these neutrinos, they are coming from very different type of sources. A sun is completely different in nature compared to your atmosphere. And also you should appreciate that these neutrinos have completely different range of energies, starting from few MeV to say hundreds of GeV. And they are traveling different distances when they propagate from source to detector. But when you analyze all these neutrinos, their data, then you see one thing common in that data set is that neutrinos change their flavor if you allow them to move in space and time. So neutrino oscillation is a very robust, but at the same time, a very simple quantum mechanical phenomena. And I want to assure you that we have just started our journey. Things are happening around you. And this is a very interesting time to do neutrino science. Now, let me proceed. I just want to briefly mention the simple neutrino oscillation picture. So when we talk about neutrino oscillation, we know that neutrinos are produced or detected in the flavor basis where you identify them as a flavor neutrinos, like electron, muon, or tau. But when they propagate from source to detector, they propagate in mass basis. So for neutral leptons, for neutrinos, the mass eigenstate does not coincide with the flavor eigenstate. And you can see that these flavor eigenstates can be connected with mass eigenstates or these flavor eigenstates are linear superposition of these mass eigenstates via this Euler rotation, which contains one mixing angle theta. So when you ask a question that if you start with a neutrino flavor alpha, what is the probability that if you allow these neutrinos to travel a distance L that we call baseline with an energy E, it will convert to a new flavor beta that calculation is very simple and I'm sure you all have done that calculation. And when you do that calculation, you land up with this simple expression which contains two sine square function. You see the first function, it contains the mixing angle theta and it tells you, it determines the height of the oscillation rather or the amplitude of the oscillation. And you know, in quantum mechanics, you are familiar with the concept of wave particle duality. <coughs> so sometimes you can treat neutrinos as particles, sometimes you can treat them as wave. So when neutrinos propagate, and you can just consider them as a simple wave, then the mass of that particle will determine the frequency of the oscillation of that wave. So here, this quantity delta m i j square, which is nothing but the mass square difference, that will tell you what is the shape of the oscillation or what is the frequency of the oscillation. And here you have the L, the length that neutrinos will travel and E is the energy, clear? So, if you write down this oscillation probability expression, you have two fundamental quantities. One is the theta, the mixing angle, and another is the frequency of that oscillation. And they are fundamental parameters. They are as fundamental as the mass of an electron. And we should have dedicated experiments to measure the value of these parameters. And this is the goal primary goal of neutrino science. We, are, we have lots of experiments running. In the past, we had lots of experiments. At present, there are several neutrino oscillation experiments taking data. And in future, we will have big experiments. And the goal is to precisely measure 
<coughs> this oscillation parameter. <coughs> okay, we know all about all this. Now, if you go to three flavor, because we are dealing with three light active neutrinos, then the connection between the mass eigenstate and the flavor eigenstate will be set by this three cross three unitary mixing matrix and it contains three rotations. So if you see my cursor on the extreme left, we have the mixing angle theta two three. So this mixing angle we have been able to measure by observing the data from atmosphere and from long baseline accelerator. If you see at the extreme left uh, right, you have the mixing angle theta one two, which we know as which we know as solar mixing angle, and we have learned about this mixing angle by analyzing the solar Newton oscillation data and also the long baseline reactor neutrino, especially the Kamlan from Kamlan, you know, we also had measurement of this mixing angle theta. Now, if you work in simple two flavor scenario, then either you deal with this mixing angle theta two, three, or you deal with this mixing angle theta one, two. But in 2012, we had the discovery of the smallest lepton mixing angle theta one three. And immediately after that discovery, we got to know that we are in three flavor paradigm. We have three non-zero neutrino mixing angles. And we all know that now value of theta one three is around 8.6 degree. And this is precisely measured. The relative error on this mixing angle is around 3% or so. so one thing I would like to tell you to appreciate when you think about solar neutrino oscillation, like here, then the frequency that you probe that we call solar mass square difference. And by analyzing the solar oscillation data and data from Kamlan, we know that this value of this parameter is around 7.6 10 to the power minus 5 EV square. Now, I just in my previous slide mentioned about these two flavor simple probability expression. Now, if this delta m square is around 10 to the power minus 5 EV square, and you want maximum oscillation, then you can demand that the phase of this oscillation is 2n plus 1 pi by 2. So the first non trivial solution is this phase should be equal to pi by 2. So please guys take this as a homework. You just assume that this quantity is pi by two. Assume L in kilometer E in GV and this delta M square in EV square. And then make it equal to pi by two. And now if you deal with solar neutrinos where the new energy is in MEV, you can immediately calculate what is the length scale you need to have maximal oscillation. And you will get this number. So to probe the solar frequency, you need a L by E because oscillation is nothing but a sinusoidal pattern as a function of L over E, right? So this value should be around 15,000 kilometer over G. If you do the same exercise for atmospheric mass square difference, which is almost 30 times bigger than the solar mass square difference, then you can immediately calculate your L by E should be 30 times smaller, right? So uh, this L by E should be around 500 kilometer over G. And this is the typical L by E value we probe when we deal with the current long baseline experiments or atmospheric experiments, okay? So this is very important. Depending on what frequency you are going to probe, that will set the scale of L by E, okay? Now, we know that we have a very firmly established picture of three neutrino mixing. And on the left, you can see the values of this oscillation parameter. 
I have mentioned delta C two with a question mark, but I want to assure you that we are getting hints of the value of delta C two from T two K nova and from atmospheric super K data. But still, we need to go a long journey. We need to see whether we have CP violation in neutron oscillation sector, and we need to measure accurately the value of the CP phase. And here in this picture, you see that these are the mass squared of the neutrino mass eigenstates m1 square, m2 square, m3 square. And from the solar data, you know that m2 square is heavier than m1 square. So the sign of delta m2 one square is positive, but the data can't reveal whether m3 is above than m1 or below than m1. So you can order the neutrino masses in this fashion, which you call normal hierarchy or normal ordering, or you can order them in this fashion, which is known as inverted ordering. And this is an open issue in neutrino oscillation physics. We, in nature, one of the picture is correct, and with the help of matter effect, or by seeing the interference pattern between solar and atmospheric frequencies. In Juno, we have plans to measure this parameter, whether the neutrino masses are ordered normally or in inverted fashion. And also, another important question that we don't know: what is the value of the lightest neutrino mass? We know the gap, we know the differences, but we don't know what is the exact value of the lightest neutrino mass. Okay, now. i will come to my in most important theme of this uh, lecture why do we need light sterile neutrinos i just told you that we have a very nice three flavor oscillation picture we can fit all the data so what went wrong that people started talking about light sterile neutrinos so let me just briefly mention so if you see in last 20 years or so we have a long standing saga of ev scale anomalies now ev scale anomalies means we are having some data at short baseline experiments which are hinting towards that there can be a light sterile neutrino with a mass around ev scale which can explain the data that you are having at very short baseline experiments now here i have listed the various anomalies or you say data that we have gathered which are pointing towards this ev scale light sterile neutrino the first candidate in that list is lsnd i will explain about that then we have mini boon then we have the famous reactor anti neutrino anomaly and then we have gallium neutrino anomaly so i will mostly talk about this first four candidates but recently the experiments called neos dance and neutrino 4 these three experiments they are also seeing some signature of ev scale sterile oscillation and these are the references you can take a look and i'm sure that professor anatoly karbera he he has described in front of you these you know sterile or you know or this you know this reactor anti neutrinos he he gave a lecture on reactor anti neutrinos right so you must have heard about also these you know uh, short baseline reactor experiments so let me start our journey in the field of this ev scale anomalies so let me begin with the lsnd anomaly so just sit back and enjoy what lsnd told us So in Los Alamos National Lab, we had a very beautiful experiment. The experiment, the name was the liquid scintillator neutrino detector. This is this LSND, <coughs> and they took data during 1993 to 1998. So what did uh, did they do? So in that experiment, they had a 800 MeV proton beam from accelerator. that beam hit the target water target 
and when a proton beam hits the target you create lots of pions now you see these pions are short lived particle they have a finite lifetime and they will decay they will decay to muon neutrino and then you have also this muon that will also further decay and you will have a new e and new mu bar you are all familiar with muon and pion decay issue so this is what lsnd was seeing from the decay of pion and muon they had a new mu new e and new mu bar now you see this new mu bar if they will oscillate to new e bar and this new e bar you can detect in your detector in this lsnd detector via this inverse beta decay process at low energies inverse beta decay is the precisely measured cross section we know and it has the largest cross section at low energy okay so i hope my slides are visible because our electricity is gone uh, my slides are visible to you uh, yes yes okay good so they detected this new e bar if a new mu bar is oscillating to new e bar they can detect them with this inverse beta decay process because this new e bar will interact with the free protons in your detector and they will create immediately a positron and this will be annihilated with the presence of ambient e minus and you will, you will see two back to back photons these we call the prompt signal and then this neutrons will wander around and they will be further captured and you will see another photon of 2.2 mev and this we call the delayed signal and we have a time gap of around 200 microsecond between the prompt and delayed signal so you have this double coincidence signal so you have very rare chance to miss your signal right because you have this double coincidence stack so when they perform the experiment i will tell you about you know the typical so in the lsnd experiment the distance between the source and the detector was roughly 30 mev okay and these muons you know that the muon rest mass is 105 mev and you can very precisely calculate when a muon is decaying at rest what would be the energy spectra of the outgoing neutrinos and this is the energy spectra so you can see that the average the average energy of this new mu bar is around also 30 mev so guys look at this picture very carefully in lsnd experiment you had l the baseline is around 30 meter and the average energy is was around 30 mev so what is the value of l by e so in that experiment l by e was around roughly 1 clear now i just told you that in three flavor oscillation picture we know two frequencies one is solar another is atmospheric and for atmospheric you need 500 km over gv and for solar we need 15000 km over gv but for lsnd experiment if you want to explain this data in terms of oscillation your l by is completely different this is around 1 so if indeed there is some oscillation is happening then you need to invoke a new frequency all together and that should be around 1 ev square because your l by is also 1 okay so when lsnd you saw this new e bar from new mu bar with a baseline of 30 meter and energy 30 mev and if you want to explain this data in terms of oscillation you need to invoke a new frequency so the take home message is in that lsnd experiment your l by e was around 1 meter over any okay so this is the data that lsnd saw 
so here these black dots are telling you how much excess because to begin with in their detector they had mu e bar as a intrinsic beam contamination because when pions decay you also have you know mu e bar to start with so they calculated that background okay but what they saw in your detector is some number of events which are larger than the background and they call it excess so they saw an excess of around 88 events with this much error and that excess is denoted here in this picture with these black dots clear you can see here okay now if you want to explain this data with the help of neutrino oscillation that okay maybe some new mu bar is oscillating to new e bar and they are giving you positrons in your detector okay then lsnd need around you know almost 25% of oscillation probability this is the value they need so if you plot this data or analyze this data in terms of a mixing angle and a frequency i told you that in two flavor oscillation picture you have one mixing angle and one frequency one mass square difference so if you want to fit lsnd data in this plane you see this is the allowed range of the mixing angle and this is the value of delta m square that you need so here you can see the best fit was around 1 ev square okay so the summary was that if you assume that there is a sterile neutrino with a mass scale around 1 electron volt then there can be an oscillation between active to sterile so what is happening your new mu bar can go to sterile anti neutrinos and then sterile anti neutrinos can oscillate to new e bar so you can have a new mu bar going to new e bar via sterile of neutrino and you can see positrons excess positron in your detector so that was the lsnd story and they had a 3.8 sigma excess of new e bar events in a beam of new mu bar but remember you can't explain this data with your true traditional frequencies which is one is solar another is atmosphere you need a new frequency so here you see <coughs> here you have the solar frequency this is the atmospheric frequency but for lsnd you need a new frequency altogether because your l by e is 1 guys clearly take a look so you need also your delta m square around 1 ev square okay this is very important so how you can accommodate this in your oscillation picture so you had this three mass eigen states m1 m2 m3 now you can assume that i have additional mass eigen state which is m4 which is mostly sterile okay so this is the logic here you can see better that we introduce a new mass eigen state the fourth mass eigen state with a mass eigen value m4 and you can see that this gap between m4 and m1 is around 1 ev square so this gap is very large compared to the gap you have between m2 and m3 and m3 and m1 and m2 right this new splitting is very large compared to the two known splitting one is the solar another is the atmospheric so you can think like when you are analyzing this short baseline data you will not see any oscillation due to these two frequencies right so you can think of they are almost degenerate they are collapsed to a point and the only frequency that matter is the gap between 
एम वन स्क्वायर एंड एम फोर स्क्वायर क्लियर दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ओके इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चन यू रेज हैंड आई विल बी हैप्पी टू आंसर बट दिस यू शुड अंडरस्टैंड दैट टू एक्सप्लेन एल एस एन डी डेटा यू नीड अ न्यू फ्रीक्वेंसी सो टू एक्सप्लेन एज एल एस एन डी रेजल्ट आई टोल्ड यू दैट वी नीड अ हाई डेल्टा स्क्वायर वैल्यू अराउंड पॉइंट वन टू टेन ई वी स्क्वायर so you need additional neutrinos with masses around ev scale so as far as model building is concerned you can introduce this right handed neutrinos in the standard model and you can write down the dirac mass term as well as the majorana mass term and i told you that we have not seen right handed neutrinos that means they are not taking part in standard weak interaction that's why you have not seen them so you can think of that these light uh, these right handed neutrinos are nothing but the stellar neutrinos okay so let me elaborate more about this 3 plus 1 scheme so now you imagine in the left hand side you have nu e nu mu nu tau and you have also nu s and on the right hand side you have nu1 nu2 nu3 nu4 so now you need a four cross four unitary matrix which i have written here and you can immediately guess that the value of this u e4 u mu4 and u tau4 by the way what do you mean by u e4 this u e4 this mixing element tells you that how much electron neutrino flavor you have in the fourth mass eigen state which is mostly sterile so since we have not seen huge amount of active sterile oscillation so you can guess right that you know this u e4 should be very small u e4 also should be very small and this u tau4 also should be very small and the fourth mass eigen state should be mostly sterile and this is what i have written here okay so when you want to analyze this short baseline oscillation data you have two different kind of data in one experiment you can have a appearance of a new flavor you start with a flavor and you see a new flavor this is what exactly we saw in lsd experiment you started with a new mu bar and you saw new e bar and you call it appearance experiment and you can easily write down the oscillation probability expression so this is the new frequency that i am talking about delta m41 square and the value you need of this frequency is around 1 ev square now if you just carefully sit down and spend 5 minutes you can convince yourself that this sin square 2 theta this theta will be a product of u e4 square and u mu4 square if this alpha is e and beta is mu because in lsnd alpha was mu beta was e basically okay so this is sin square 2 theta mu e in lsnd so this is basically 4 u mu4 square u e4 square now if you claim that this quantity is finite then you are claiming the product of u e4 and u mu4 this quantity is non zero clear but in short baseline experiments i will now discuss in a few minute there are some short baseline experiments where you look for the disappearance basically like survival of the same flavor so you start with a flavor alpha and you detect the same flavor alpha in your detector and you just measure that how many alpha type neutrinos or anti neutrinos have disappeared and this is called disappearance experiment so we have <coughs> at short baseline electron neutrino disappearance experiment and electron 
anti neutrino disappearance experiment i will talk about them and in those experiments if they have a l over e around 1 e1 meb over you know centimeter or kilometer over gv then you should again see the signature of sterile active sterile oscillation there right but in that experiments what you will probe is this mixing angle sin square 2 theta alpha alpha now if you are working with a new e going to new e or new e bar going to new e bar this will be sin square 2 theta e e right and which is nothing but four times u e four square now if you see signal of some disappearance in short baseline electron neutrino or anti neutrino experiments then you can claim that okay to fit that data i need also non zero u e four now there are also some short baseline experiments like cdhs experiment also there are experiments you know you have experiments like minos so there what you study is the disappearance of new mu flavor so with the same analogy if you see some disappearance of new mu at short baseline you can also claim that your u mu 4 is also non zero now so far the data that we have collected we know from lsnd and i will explain mini boon also from that experiments we know the product of u e4 and u mu 4 this is non zero okay guys clearly make a note we know that the product of u e4 times u mu 4 this is non zero and from reactor and gallium anomaly that i will discuss we also know or we can claim at certain confidence level that this ue4 is also non zero but unfortunately or fortunately that you can think of we have not seen any trace of new mu disappearance at short baseline so that data is telling us that no we can't accommodate a non zero u mu 4 so you can see there is a huge tension in the data say your appearance experiment is telling that product of x and y is non zero the disappearance electron neutrino or anti neutrino experiment is telling that your x is non zero but the new mu disappearance is just telling you that y should be zero but how come this is possible so this is the famous appearance disappearance tension when you want to fit all this short baseline oscillation data by introducing one light if we scale sterile neutrino okay i hope this is clear and i'll be happy to take if you have any questions or we can discuss at the end so we have tensions when you talk about this short baseline oscillation data so where you can look for this active sterile oscillation the main mantra is wherever you will see your l by e is around 1 you can expect some active to sterile oscillation provided your delta m square the new frequency is around 1 ev square or in the range of 0.1 to 10 ev square roughly okay so you have many options starting from radioactive source experiment then you have reactor experiment accelerator or atmosphere you can look for your active sterile oscillations in all these kind of experiments wherever you will have l by e around 1 clear so now let me talk about this gallium neutrino anomaly so you are all familiar with galax and sage they were two solar neutrino experiments and in those detectors they calibrated their detector by putting some artificial 
radioactive source inside their detector okay and what were those sources are what were those sources one was 51 chromium and another was 37 argon now the beauty of these two sources that they emit monochromatic neutrino light at these energies okay and when these neutrinos are emitted you can detect them using this process in this with uh, with the gallium target okay now this was what we known as gallium uh, neutrino anomaly now you know that you know you have your source inside the detector right and they are traveling only few meters inside the detector and the energy is also around MeV or so. So your L by is also around one. But if there is no new frequency, you should not expect any oscillation from active to sterile, right? Here on the left hand side in this picture, I'm showing the data from this experiment. And you see, here they, we have plotted the ratio of measured the data over the prediction. Now, guys, try to understand. If there are no active to sterile oscillation, then you should expect all the neutrinos that are getting emitted from these sources, you should detect them. Because nothing has been oscillated to sterile, which you can't detect basically. But when they measured this ratio, that ratio was not around one. Rather, the ratio was below one. You can see these data points, okay? Now the question is, how can you explain this data? What happened to those electron neutrinos? You are seeing that your measured rate is low compared to the predicted rate. And that's why the ratio is less than one. Again, you can bring light sterile neutrinos in the picture and you can say that, okay, look, your L by is close to one. So what if, if I have a new sterile state around EV scale and maybe, maybe some electron neutrino has disappeared into sterile neutrino and you are seeing that's why less number of electron neutrino there. And that was the famous gallium neutrino anomaly. And you saw a disappearance around 2.7 sigma signal of active to sterile oscillation. But remember, here you are dealing with electron neutrinos. So to explain this 2.7 sigma oscillation, you need finite UE4 that I just talked about. Okay. Now, now I will discuss briefly in next 10 minutes or so, the famous reactor antineutrino anomaly. Okay. So what is this oscillation with reactor antineutrinos? I hope you are all familiar with reactor oscillation experiments. You had a nice lecture by Professor Anatoly. So in reactor oscillation experiments, you create electron antineutrinos from reactors, right? From the decay of, you know, radioactive sources and the energy of these neutrinos around MeV. Now, in the past, we had a reactor antineutrinos experiment called Kamland. You see, the value of LYE of Kamland was around this much, okay? And with the help of Kamlan data, reactor antineutrino oscillation data, we measured the frequency, the solar and at uh, mass square difference. And now we are going to have Juno <coughs> with a baseline around 50 kilometer, somewhere around here. <coughs> and in Daya Bay, we had a L by E of around 500 kilometer over GB. That is why they were sensitive to atmospheric mass square difference. And we could measure the mixing angle theta one, three. Now, if you go down further 
on the left in l by e if you take smaller l by e values and if you take around 1 meter over mev if you plan some experiment around this l by e value you should be sensitive to 1 ev square splitting as well right this is a very basic concept and you should have a very clear idea about that if you don't understand this now there is no point of talking further so i'm again asking you if you have any question you can stop me and i'll be happy to explain now you must have learned that you produce this new e bar from reactors and you use this inverse beta decay process to detect them this i will not elaborate you are familiar now what happened when people were making this double show detector and they were trying to analyze the data from double show reactor anti neutrino experiment with a single far detector there were scientists this mueller et al they came up with a improved technique to learn better about the emitted electron anti neutrino spectra from these radioactive sources they improved their calculation okay and due to that improved calculation there was a net 3% increase in the estimated flux so what they estimated is that the reactor anti neutrino flux is three times more then you can ask but we have the data now you are saying from your theoretical calculation that you have 3% more neutrino anti neutrino flux so what happened to those 3 3% extra anti electron anti neutrino again you can explain that excess in terms of active sterile oscillation that okay the data is data you have already seen the data so to explain the data you can assume that some of these electron anti neutrinos from the reactors they must have oscillated to sterile and you have not seen them and you can explain that excess nicely by invoking a light ev still sterile neutrino then professor patrick huber also finds a similar trend with his calculation and i urge strongly that you should read these two papers to get to know more about this reactor anti neutrino anomaly because the whole discussion of this reactor anti neutrino anomaly started with these two papers when they improved the calculation of estimated fluxes so this is the various data short baseline reactor experiments from short baseline reactor experiments and you can see you can fit the data quite well if you include one light additional sterile neutrino at ev scale you can see this blue line okay so the mean average ratio including the correlations was around 0.927 and it indicates that they were seeing around 7.3% deficit less new e bar in their experiment and you can think that this deficit is nothing but some electron anti neutrinos were oscillated to sterile and remember you don't see sterile neutrinos in your detector because they don't take part in weak interaction okay so if you fit all the data from this short baseline reactor oscillation experiments this is the fit that was performed in 2013 and this is the reference and you can see that you can nicely fit your data with this choice of delta m square and this is the value of the mixing angle okay here they have taken three different choices of frequency and mixing angle so you can take a close look and these are the various experiments okay guys but remember you should appreciate that all in all these experiments your l by e was around 1 meter over mev 
what is the future of short baseline reactor anti neutron experiments so here in this slide on this slide i have mentioned the experiments we are which are now taking data and will be taking data in near future also will keep on taking data the experiments are dance neos there is neutrino 4 prospect solid and stereo there are the six powerful experiments i will not go in detail you can take a look at my slide about the details of this experiment okay but again all the these experiments has uh, you know have l by e around 1 meter over meb and they have very nice energy resolution and they expect large amount of inverse beta decay events in their detector and i am quite sure that the data that we will have from these experiments should be able to tell us whether there is a light sterile neutrino at 1 eb scale or not with high confidence when i say they will tell us they can tell us whether there is a sterile neutrino or there is there is no sign of sterile neutrino. so we need to wait we need to analyze these uh, the data from this experiment very precisely but but keep in mind when you analyze the reactor short baseline electron anti neutron oscillation data you need to be very very accurate about your reactor fluxes and the systematics and the energy resolution or the you have to have a very precise energy calibration of the detector otherwise you can always land up with a wrong fit and you can say okay i have seen a signature of active sterile oscillation but that is not the oscillation that you are seeing that is basically a wrong fit of the data okay so one has to be very careful so on this slide on the left hand side you see what is the present status when we have data from these various experiment how they are doing so you can see if you take any curve the area right hand side of the curve is excluded okay and the area which are on the right hand side or left hand side of the each curve this is still allowed okay so that's why we call this is the present sensitivity landscape of very short baseline reactor experiment but in future we will have more data strong experiments and we feel we we think that we will be able to cover more parameter space with high confidence level and this is what we expect in future so can you see guys just for an instance instance the dance experiment if you see the present data this is the green line that is the exclusion plot from dance at present but they are going to take data in next few years and if everything will go fine that will be their future sensitivity okay similarly you can see this is the prospect the present sensitivity this will be their future sensitivity so they will have much better sensitivity around 1 ev square mass square difference and i hope they will contribute largely in coming years to tell us whether there is a light ev scale sterile neutron you know, at 1 ev square or not okay now let me explain what was the mini bone experiment so i told you about lsn dna so people were very excited that we are seeing a four sigma excess in a new mu bar, bar beam going to new e bar so why don't we come up with a dedicated experiment lsnd kind of experiment with similar l by e value and let us see if we see that signature of oscillation again so in fermi lab 
people came up with this fantastic mini moon experiment. Again, the concept was you have a proton beam, you hit the beam with a beryllium target, you create pions, they will decay and you will have a new mu bar. You see here, they will again oscillate to new e bar and you will see this E plus in your detector as a signature of new mu bar to new e bar, new mu bar to new e bar oscillation at one EV square mass square difference. Now, in mini boon, the distance that L that they had, these neutrinos, it was around 487 meter. Can you see in this cartoon? And they also had energy around 500 MeV, the average energy. So again, the L by E value in mini boon was around 1. Clear, guys? So if LSND is correct, you should expect some new mu bar to new e bar oscillation in mini boon. Now in mini boon experiment, they had neutrinos from both pi minus and pi plus decay. So they observed new mu to new e oscillation and at the same time new mu bar to new e bar oscillation also. Okay. So this is the analysis of the mini boon data. This is the range of the energy. And this is the excess. Excess means on top of the background, how many excess positron events you are seeing in your detector. And this is the excess they saw in neutrino mode. And this was the excess they saw in the anti-neutrino mode. But there is a caveat that they still have a mild tension between this neutrino anti-neutrino data around two sigma, but here, here I can, I, I'm showing you the event distribution in the neutrino mode here. And here you have this excess in the neutrino mode and the anti-neutrino mode. The red line is for neutrino and the cyan line is for anti-neutrino. And if you combine these two data set, you have around 4.8 sigma excess. Okay. Now, I want to just tell you a word of caution that in mini boon experiment, they didn't have any near detector. So they didn't have any telescope to tell you what the flux they are having from their source. They just work with a far detector. So you can't do a far over near measurement to cancel your systematics related to flux and cross section. And another important caveat we had in mini boon that in their detector, when this new E bar comes in your detector and it gives you positron, in their detector, the signal from a photon, because you can always have a pi zero from neutral current, and that pi zero decays to two photon, right? And in their detector, the signal of a photon and the signal of a positron, they look quite similar. So when I say that they saw 400 excess events, there is a discussion going on that whether this excess is due to electron or positron or this is due to the photons. So this is a puzzle that we have in mini boot. And to resolve this puzzle, now they have come up with a dedicated short baseline neutrino program in Fermilab where there is a detector called micro boot. And they will have data very soon. They will have a release, they will have data and that micro boon experiment. So from mini boon, we have now micro boon. And the goal of the micro boon experiment is to resolve this puzzle between photon and positron signal. They have a detector with a 3D spectroscopy with a very fine 
energy and angular resolution and they will be able to tell you if they see some excess whether this is due to uh, electron or positron or is it a photon so this puzzle of my mini bone will be resolved when micro bone will release their data this is we hope this, this is our hope basically okay so the question is if you have a ev scale sterile neutrino can you explain both lsnd and mini bone signal look guys in both the experiments you have seen signature of new mu to new e oscillation or new mu bar to new e new mu bar to new e bar oscillation at l by e of around 1 now on the left hand side you see with the various line solid lines these are the exclusion plots at various confidence level from mini bone and these shaded regions are the allowed regions from lsnd at two different confidence level and if you combine both the data set your best fit is coming around this you see the right hand picture which will give you a better picture so you see this red zone the red area this star okay so you can see here this is the allowed range in the parameter space of theta mu e which is nothing but the product of u e4 times u mu4 and delta m41 square in that plane this is the allowed region by lsnd and mini bone i just told you if you just combine mini bone neutrino anti neutrino data you have 4.8 sigma excess now if you combine lsnd mini bone neutrino and anti neutrino you have a combined 6.1 sigma excess now guys this is not a small signal and that's why people are taking this signal seriously but i told you there is a disappearance appearance tension and because of that you know we can't say conv convincingly that we have a light ev scale sterile and we need future experiment if you just plot the lsnd and mini bone data as a function of l by e this is a very interesting plot you see the data set right this is the these are the various data set and now you can fit that data with this black line you can see that this is the l by e value of this black line okay so if you go in the phase value the 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 scaling that you see in l by e seems to support lsnd and mini bone data this is very interesting now i would like to just spend few minutes on this mion disappearance results i told you that we have seen the signal of new mu bar oscillating to new e bar in lsnd and mini bone and if you believe in this data set they are telling you that the product of theta 1 4 the mixing angle and theta 2 4 it should be non zero i also discussed about gallium electron neutrino anomaly and that data is telling you that your value of theta 1 4 is also non zero i just explained the reactor electron anti neutrino anomaly and if you ex explain that data in terms of active sterile oscillation that data is telling you that theta 14 is again non zero but there are caveats there are experiments like cdhs ccfr and also the disappearance data of shibun and minibun 
data from super cameo candy atmospheric neutron experiment atmospheric data from ice cube experiment which is taking data at the south pole and data from minos and minos plus this experiment is already over by the way so if the product of theta 14 and theta 24 is non zero and theta 14 alone is non zero and if the both the measurements are compatible with each other then theta 24 has to be also non zero now what is theta 24 theta 24 is the mixing angle you know with the nu2 and nu4 mass eigen states so you expect that some of the nu mu can oscillate to sterile and i should see less number of muon disappearance or less number of survived muon events in this experiment but when they analyze the data people analyze the, the data from this so many experiments they didn't see any sign of muon disappearance by taking the data around l by e of 1 and the tightest limit on the mixing angle theta t24 is coming now from the ice cube experiment okay can you see here guys but remember ice cube the energy that ice cube probe is very very high pv pv energy right so the atmospheric neutrinos that ice cube is sensitive is above 500 gv to few t okay now with that energy and if your length is very large then they expect some msw resonance in their anti neutrino data set okay but they have not seen that that trace of msw resonance in their anti neutrino data set they have not seen that and that's why they can put a very tight constraint on that active sterile parameter space and you see this curve this magenta or yeah this is the purple curve from the ice cube experiment the black curve is from minos and the green is from minos and black is minos and minos plus and you have also super cameo candy the blue line so what all these data is uh, are telling you that we are not seeing any signal of muon disappearance in our data set at l by e of 1 so there is no anomaly there is no evidence of sterile oscillation we have only constraints so they are not telling us that theta 24 is non zero and this is again the root of this appearance and disappearance tension i hope this is very clear to you guys okay so in this plot i am showing if you analyze all the short baseline oscillation data our friends in this paper they carefully analyzed all the short baseline oscillation data and they come up with this global fit and on the left hand side <coughs> you see this is the allowed region by lsnd and minibol and they are seeing some signal so this is the allowed region but if you take the disappearance experiment they don't have any allowed region they have only exclusion limits right and these two limits or the data are not compatible with each other right they are not overlapping with each other clear guys so this is the appearance disappearance again i am repeating appearance disappearance tension you can see the same picture here also okay so this is the tension that we need to resolve in coming days but don't worry there are many good experiments high precision experiments are in the pipeline 
so if you ask me that what is the best bet how you can resolve this anomaly to me the best bet is that you start with a very intense neutrino source that can be a radioactive source or a small core reactor source or neutrinos from muon decay at rest so these these are all meb neutrinos okay and you put your detector very close to the source so that your l by e is around 1 MeV over meter meter uh, meter over MeV or kilometer over G. And now, if there is some active to sterile oscillation, then you should be able to see that oscillation wave in your detector, because the oscillation length is nothing but four pi e by delta n square. Now I am giving you a homework. Take uh, the energy of a neutrino one MeV, and delta m square is one EV square, and calculate if there is an oscillation at one EV square mass square difference. What will be the typical oscillation length? It will be around some meters, right? So that means. you are capturing the entire oscillation wave in your detector so here in this cartoon this is your detector right and this is your source and when a neutrino is emitting it will start immediately oscillating due to this frequency which is around 1 ev square and you should be able to see the entire oscillation in your detector you just bin your data in l by e and you will see this nice sinusoidal pattern in your detector clear so this is we call the neutrino oscillometry at short baseline you are seeing the neutrino oscillation wave the sterile active sterile neutrino oscillation wave in your detector if there will be no active sterile oscillation then you will just see a data which is falling at as 1 by l square right because when neutrinos are just going far from the source the flux gets depleted as 1 by l square this is 1 by 4 pi l square right with solid angle so if there is no oscillation you will not see a sinusoidal pattern you will just see a 1 by l square dependence but if you see a nice l by e dependence then you are sure you are sure that you have seen a signature of active sterile oscillation in your detector and look guys each data point on this wave is your data is your measurement so if you bin your data around this l by e you will have one data then you will have another data here another data here and if you just combine this data set and if you take the ratio of these two data point you will be able to cancel all your systematics almost and you can what you will see is just what you will remain with your l by e oscillation pattern so in my opinion this kind of experiments should be able to clear this picture of active sterile oscillation and people have planned that's why so many experiments with smaller reactor core at short baseline okay there is another candidate which is going to come very soon in fermi lab this is called fermi lab short baseline neutrino appearance experiment okay so in that experiment they will have basically three liquid argon detector one is the short baseline near detector here you can see at 100 meter from the source then you have this micro boon i already mentioned at 470 meter and then they have this icarus detector you know this icarus was one it was in gran sasso in italy and then they shipped the whole detector from italy to us and now 
you have that icarus detector on the same pipeline so it is a trio they have three liquid argon detector at three different length scale one is 100 meter another is 470 meter and icarus is at 600 meter and since their energy is around 0.5 gv or so the average energy you should expect that this detector should see an active sterile oscillation so this is a future sensitivity in the appearance mode and you can see that if this experiment will take data and will go everything along our expectation they should be able to cover the lsnd parameter space at more than 5 sigma confidence level if there is active sterile oscillation they will have huge amount of data around this parameter space and if there is nothing they should be able to discard this parameter space space at more than 5 sigma confidence level okay you can see this is the 5 sigma line so this experiment we have high hope from this fermi lab short baseline neutrino appearance oscillation experiment now they will have also muon disappearance so in this slide you can see this is the future sensitivity as far as the theta 2 4 mixing angle is concerned and you can see they can also will be they will be also they will be able to cover a large range of the parameter space either they will validate the uh, muon disappearance or they will reject at a very high confidence so they are the two most important candidates where we have high hopes they that they will be able to resolve the issue of this active sterile oscillation so let me conclude that light sterile neutrinos they were interesting they are still interesting and will remain interesting believe me and you should appreciate that if you discover a light sterile neutrino you will prove that there is a new physics beyond the standard model at low energies we have been discussing so much about lsc right but the energy that you probe in lsc is around tv so and the next goal of lsc after the discovery of higgs is to look for new physics they are desperately looking for supersymmetry extra dimension some new physics to extend the landscape of three flavor neutrinos or you know the basic standard model picture but if you can see a stress of light sterile neutrino at low energies these two measurements will complement each other and i think this is the biggest motivation i have when i study about light sterile neutrinos that we should have new experiments we should have more study <coughs> and we should look for them at low energies so that we can see some signal of new physics because these sterile neutrinos are not part of your basic standard model picture even the neutrino mass is beyond the standard model now on top of that if you see a sterile neutrino you will be even more beyond standard model okay so i think we should study more about these guys we should have dedicated experiments and we should look for them so let us continue our effort to look for these sterile neutrinos at any mass scale and at any energies i want to just emphasize one thing in last one and half hour i was telling about ev scale sterile neutrino right but from theoretical point of view we don't have any constant on the allowed mass scale of new, these extra sterile species so in principle this sterile can be at any mass scale can be at kv can be at mev or gv or above so you should have experiment at different mass scale basically because they can be anywhere okay 
the possibility is there it is not ruled out okay so we should look for these sterile at all this all possible mass scales and we at all possible energies and this is the message i want to convey i would like to stop here and i will take questions now thank you uh, thank you very for very much for the very energetic uh, lecture uh is there any question for professor sanjeev yes. please feel free to ask me questions otherwise i will assume that you know everything uh don't be shy yes do you have any question can okay maybe i can go can you back to the slide you showed that this um this kind of uh, discrepancy between appearance and disappearance this one yes or uh, uh, i i think the one more before let's see uh, this one yeah i i think this is just show the uh, analytical formula but uh, from what you tell the appearance and disappearance tension mm. uh, from which data uh... oh so the tension that i showed these are all very short baseline you know accelerator data you have short baseline reactor oscillation data so you are talking about the which data set we use right so you can see you know you see these are the all experiments short baseline reactor experiments they analyze the data you can see the rovno buje you know carmen uh, so and you have also appearance lsnd carmen cdhs so there are plethora of data where you probe l by e of around 1 meter over mev so here for an instance you can clearly see these are the short baseline reactor experiment buje then you have rovno then you have you know gosgen buje 3 krashen and all these experiments ill also so they all have you know this data and you can explain that data with a l by e of around 1 meter over mev so this is the data that they use to constrain theta 14 and they are telling us that theta 14 may be finite non zero okay this is as far as electron disappearance measurements are concerned and if you see the um appearance you have the data from lsnd carmen minibun and this is the combined fit they are also telling that you know you have a non zero value of theta 14 times theta 24 right but yeah. but, but i get did to data set it pointing to different value of theta 14 right see here you can see uh, like in this plot let me just go there yeah so this is a product of theta 14 times theta 24 because you need to understand that in appearance experiment you will not see any signal of new mu bar to new mu bar oscillation unless until both theta 14 and theta 24 is finite right so what they constrain is the product of theta 14 times theta 24 and this is the parameter space but if you just think about only disappearance experiment from only reactor they prefer some theta 14 value and they also don't agree with each other i agree i i completely agree with that you that the theta 14 that you require to explain the appearance data and to explain the very short baseline reactor data they also have a tension but that tension is not that big as this appearance disappearance tension where this disappearance line is basically from your experiments like cdhs minos or ice cube right okay 
and now I understand that one. Um, uh, is there any more question? Hello, sir. Yes. Hello, sir. I have a general doubt regarding neutron oscillations. Uh, for uh, why do you always consider the mixing matrix to be unitary? Can it be non-unitary also? Yes, very good question. So we assume that when you measure this probability, the sum of the total oscillation probability should be one and that comes from your assumption of this U matrix to be unitary, right? Because suppose if you start with a new E, and so what is the possibility? It can oscillate to a new, new mu, new tau or sterile, whatever. But if you sum of them, all these oscillation probabilities, you should expect one, right? Now you are correct. This is, you have this three cross three neutrino matrix, right? Light active neutrinos. But if you see the global bigger picture where, so these three light active neutrinos are left-handed. But to give rise to neutrino mass, you can invoke three right-handed neutrinos, right? Also. So your matrix is not exactly three by three, but it is six by six, right? That is the bigger picture. And these three right-handed neutrinos, you can assume that they are at very high, high energy scale. And that's why, you know, you have not seen them and, you know, they are mostly sterile. Okay. So the mixing matrix that we are probing with the light active neutrinos, this three cross three PMNS matrix, it is a subset of the bigger six cross six matrix. And in that bigger picture, that neutrino, you know, if you go think about, then this three flavor oscillation picture can also have some amount of non-unitarity also. So, Think about, you know, this U matrix. Let me go there for you. So think about this. If you think about a three cross three or four cross four, and if this is a unitary matrix, what do you expect? You expect that this UE1 square plus UE2 square plus UE3 square plus UE4 square should be one, right? That is the unitarity condition. Or the product of u e1 times mu1 plus u e2 times mu2 plus u e3 times mu3 plus u e4 times u mu4 that should be zero that is the unitarity condition now if you measure these mixing elements very very precisely in future and if you can reduce the error very very precisely and if you then sum these quantities and if they will not be equal to one, then you can claim that I have seen some non-unitary neutrino mixing, but you can well postulate them in the bigger six cross six picture. So the answer to your question that you are allowed to consider that this neutrino oscillation can also be non-unitary, but for that, you need to have a very, very ultra precise measurement of these mixing elements. And if they don't sum to be one, you can invoke some non unitary neutrino mixing. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, is there any more questions? Uh, so, by the way, so do you have any kind of prospect on searching the state of neutrino with the new neutral current interaction? Yes, very good question. I'm happy that you raised this because I just didn't get time. So, yes, you, you know that neutral current interactions are flavor blind. So, basically, especially the mixing angle, which is theta 3, 4. If you want to measure that angle, you need to rely on neutral current measurement because if you uh, have some active to sterile oscillation, then since these sterile neutrinos will not interact in your detector, 
so then you know this neutral current measurement will not sum up to one right so definitely if you see some depletion in the neutral current event rate then you should be able to infer about this you know active sterile mixing angle in the context of long baseline oscillation experiments people have already explored this possibility there are a couple of papers one paper is by boris kaiser et al and another paper was by pilar poloma et al they ex uh, they explored that possibility even in the context of long baseline experiment but only only issue, issue with neutral current measurement is that there is a strong feed down effect in neutral current so what is neutral current and neutrino is coming and a neutrino is outgoing so the maximum amount of available energy in the final state is going is taken away by neutrino the invisible neutrinos so the reconstructed energy in the final state will be very small compared to the incoming neutrino energy right because you don't see the outgoing left the neutrino the lepton so you will reconstruct your final state particles in the neutral current event at a much lower energies compared to your true neutrino energy and this is known as the so called feed down effect but you, if you want to reconstruct these events precisely you need to know this migration of from true to reconstructed energy very very precise you need to know that there are two things one is the kinematics another is your reconstruction properties of the detector so the summary is you need to calibrate your energy very precisely you need to have a very fine energy resolution to make sure that you have reconstructed your neutral current events properly because remember you also have too many backgrounds also you know when the neutral currents events where you accumulate the neutral current events and also these are at lower energies where we have large cross section uncertainties okay due to 2p 2h process quasi elastic one fine resonance processes we have lots of cross section uncertainties so when you will claim that you have seen some active sterile oscillation through neutral current you have to be a bit careful but that possibility is wide open okay thank you very much uh is there any more question discussion Okay, I didn't see any more question. So, thank you very much, Professor Sanjeev. Uh, and if some of you joining new fact, the talk from Professor Sanjeev uh, on the physics beyond the standard model, I think on Friday, right? Yeah, on on tenth of September. Yeah. Uh, it will be around eight thirty Indian Standard Time or five pm European time. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving lecture on this topic for Thanks the a lot, school. Professor. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, for everyone, so we have a long break, one and a half hour. Then um, after that, we will join and discuss on the progress of a mini project. Okay. So I will. I am stopping uh, sharing my slides. I will share the slides with you. Ah. which you can share with the students and they can write to me my email address is there at the very beginning of my slide for any questions comments they can write to me or they can connect us with our twitter page this is our twitter page and they should feel free to ask questions leave any comments and we will reply to them oh yeah thank you very much yeah i okay. i will upload the your slides soon Okay, great. So I'm stopping and sharing my slide. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Bye.